Hey guys, uh, welcome back to Total Tactics Football. It's Fran here, and I'll be finally recapping our Game Week 1 team. Uh, and of course, there's been a lot of transfers so far, Danny Ings, Aston Villa, be namely being one, and a lot of injuries that have been suffered in the preseason, as well as, you know, through the kind of European events. And we're still dealing with uh, not knowing exactly who's nailed on for Game Week 1, simply due to the fact that there is a lot of um, players who are recovering and, and, and have kind of had knocks as well and haven't been necessarily participating in preseason as much as we've liked. In the back, you'll actually see that there's a messy kit. Um, I've just put it there because, you know, simply it, it, it's it's just to kind of pay respects to all his achievements as a football player, a wonderful player and, and, and wonderful career for Barcelona. It'll be interesting to see where he goes next. Uh, likely League One, but if we go back to the Premier League, uh, let's just start off with the defenders uh, for fantasy game week one. So I've gone for a template kind of defensive setup where um, this will be kind of a back three, right? So I've gone for Shaw, and, and we know that uh, Shaw makes a lot of sense because there's so much upside where as soon as he kind of locked in that starting position from Tellez uh, last year, he started to develop extremely well. And I think his expected goals, expected assist percentages um, are actually very good as a defender. And he, I would argue, has un underperformed on that last year. And I actually expect better dividends this year, especially with uh, Man United hiring a set-piece coach and him kind of taking a much more impactful role with the kind of left-sided corners and potentially Man United score more goals through that sort of avenue and maybe him even taking some free kicks that aren't a, a direct free kicks, right? Because Bruno will be taking those direct free kicks on goal. Um, an interesting thing, of course, with Digne is a lot of people have, have kind of felt that Digne has become a much worse option, looking especially to alternatives such as Sufa and Cresswell. And, and you'll look at the remainder of my team later to kind of understand why I might not have gone for Digne uh, for a West Ham player at that point in defense right now. But I, I, I still like Digne because, simply put, even in the United game, he was managing to create a lot of opportunities. And whilst I expect that Dominic Harvey-Lewin probably won't participate in game week one, I still think there's good potential, especially just due to how nice those fixtures are, to keep Digne in your team and kind of hope that Benitez can get uh, the ship short, you know, before the season starts. He hasn't exactly had the ideal preseason. A lot of his players, as I said, have played abroad, and, and that's kind of affected his preseason uh, kind of preparation. But I do expect them to have good games no matter what. And I think Dine is clearly a player who passes the eye test and, and someone you pick as well because um, you expect over the course of the season, I think Everton will have better kind of returns. And I think past game week one or two, where it could be potentially a little bit worse than we expected, I think Dine could be great. Uh, you know, even if we have to wild card necessarily a bit later and, and kind of take the L. Uh, I still like his kind of potential because even though he wasn't taking all the set pieces in the match versus Man United, I still saw a lot of avenues for him to kind of create chances. And I think versus worse opposition, uh, Everton can do better. The kind of bench, uh, you know, for this team, especially for the defense, is going to be Ben White and it's going to be Amarte. I thought Amarte had a fantastic game and, and he plays because, you know, Fofana has been injured. Leicester haven't necessarily bought a uh, centre-back to replace Fofana yet, and Evans is injured until roughly the, in the international break. So that gives great opportunity for us to have access to the Leicester defence at a 4.0 price, and I think you can't really pass that up. It's like almost getting an upgrade over Fofana temporarily, right, uh, for a cheaper cost. And then looking at um, you know Ben White, I, 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 I try to actually incorporate Chambers into my team, but when I think about it, I do want to have a bench that actually plays. Chambers will likely still rotate a little bit with Bellerin. It seems like that the preference from Arteta watching the Spurs match is that when he feels that the enemy wingers are pacey and, and give that kind of threat, which Chambers isn't very well adapted to, he will probably likely play Bellerin, which means that Ben White is probably the only nailed 4.5 Arsenal defender. And for that reason, I am going to go with Ben White and play it a bit safe there, even though his selection percentage is a little bit high. Uh, but that's it for the defenders. I think they all make sense um, given the fact that um, you know, Arsenal and, and Leicester are strong defenses, uh, and I think you're kind of you have access to them at a cheaper price. So those kind of players can can build value, in my opinion, even though they have tough fixtures. You know, Arsenal were did very handedly versus Chelsea as an example, and then of course the other players are the, the kind of world class fullbacks in our league that are able to create chances week in week out. And, and for that reason, I think there's nothing wrong with them. The only thing wrong might be you arguing that I don't have a West Ham defender. And to be honest, I agree with you because the statistics for the West Ham defenders are fantastic. Both Sufal and Cresswell make a lot of sense to go in teams. It's just that right now with the composition of my team, I don't necessarily want to go too deep into West Ham. And you'll see why when we move on to the midfielders. So with the midfielders, you'll actually see that 
You know, the crazy pick I have in there is going to be Ben Rama. He has a very low selection percentage right now. It's, it's suddenly creeped week in, week out. And I did initially have Bowen, you know, in the first iteration of my fantasy team because I really liked the way that West Ham were playing and approaching preseason. And I think that they carried on a lot of great form from last season and finally found an attacking structure to play very fancy, attract, attractive and attacking football. And, you know, their tough fixture is going to be Leicester in game week two. But I, I thought West Ham played fantastically versus Leicester last season, both times that I w watched them play. And I think Leicester do struggle with a team that has a lot of dynamic threats and um, are also very kind of capable of playing the counter-attack. That's something I think that City isn't exactly super well versed at. And, and, and you know, Leicester can sometimes be caught in transition themselves. And I think that's what West Ham present as a threat. Then the other kind of fixtures are quite nice for West Ham. And simply put, Ben Rama has had probably the best preseason out of all players not named uh, Son and Mares, in my opinion. And at that kind of price, I mean, it's really worth that kind of gamble. Of course, now it looks like I don't have any other 6.5 players. And you might say, you know, what about Buendia? What about Rafinha? And I think, yes, Rafinha is definitely, uh, you know, he's kind of like the statistical god in terms of the midfield category on, on kind of a price basis, right, for FPL. And, and simply put, his stats are amazing. And I do actually expect myself to potentially go into a structure where maybe I downgrade Jota eventually to someone like Barnes and then I go for an upgrade on Ben Rama if I, I see the op opportunity there or simply just to downgrade Jota once I think Firmino could find his way back onto the team once he's kind of recovered and maybe if Jota isn't firing. So that's kind of my thinking right now. I think Jota in game week one versus Norwich, I don't think a team uh, that is defensively ex exceptional in my opinion. I think this is an opportunity where he gets to continue to build on his preseason form and potentially score. Uh, maybe one or two goals for Snorwich, or at least assist, right? And he's obviously a cheaper alternative to someone like Mane, who's part of that kind of three-way trident. And with Liverpool, I mean, I, I don't see a triple up uh, through, let's say, getting Van Dijk and Trent making any sense. You know, if you want to triple up on Liverpool now, especially Robertson now, I think it only makes sense to kind of have Trent and then double up on two attackers, uh, that being Jota and someone else, um, if you're a bit more risk-averse um, or kind of... Um, Kind of risk-seeking uh but for me you know i've, I've gone with this, the trident trusted salah and, and simply put it's because of the fact that he kind of has those penalties as well yes the premier league is, is is implementing rules to make sure that softer penalties are not taken but still when you actually look at the kind of players that liverpool have on player they're still going to be drawing a select amount of penalties this year and i expect them to be actually much more effective in attack which means much more chances created in the enemy box therefore also more penalties and simply more chances for Salah ultimately and he becomes a fantastic captaincy choice that I think pairs very well with Bruno. Now Bruno of course is going to be the second question of, of my team you know uh, about not having Rafinha. I think Buendia could be another question but I think with the kind of uh, potential injury slash knock issue and and I think Dean Smith's kind of history of not really admitting to the extent of injuries as well I kind of want to stave off Buendia for now because I'm not exactly sure of how he'll play. I've also seen uh, Aston Villa play a 4-4-2 uh, and also a 4-2-3-1 a little bit in, in, in possession um, versus, uh, I think, one of, the, one of the newly promoted Serie A sides uh, today. And I wasn't exactly sure exa it, if Buendia could play a hugely prominent role in that structure. I think, you know, both Watkins and Ings are still kind of interesting threats right now. And uh, with El Ghazi potentially being deeper into the bench or finding his way back onto the bench. I think Ing can take penalties and, and he'll be a in, much more interesting threat uh, to kind of pick an Aston Villa with. Because, you know, going for two Aston Villa players, let's say, um, when you go for kind of game weeks one to three, and then having to kind of think about pivoting both of them out, that's kind of, um, I think, hurting a little bit because you, you might have some shock transfers that you need to make and you don't necessarily want to transfer two of your players too early. Uh, so that's kind of my thinking. I kind of want to only go with one Villa player at this moment in time, even though I think Buendia is a fantastic player in his own right. And I think you could definitely pick Buendia if you think he fits your structure and you're probably not going to go for Ings and you might go for an alternative like Bamford or Dominic Carver-Lewin when he's fit. Uh, but just going back to the last uh, kind of midfielder, so it, it, it's it's the discussion about Bruno, right? So Bruno, for me, is is a player that you have to kind of keep in your team right now because I think... I don't think, see this kind of Man United team necessarily moving to this 4-3-3 that is so acclaimed to kind of push him a lot deeper, make him a much more less effectual. I, I still see the kind of free roaming role that he has for the team. You know, Bruno is a player who even in last year played sometimes a bit more of a defensive role because he would press 
in, in kind of free, free kind of positions. And, and he would move all across the field to kind of fill in spaces for this United side. And I, I see him playing a very similar role. He also has the penalties and the set pieces, you know, being a free kick threat and someone who can also actually find great balls in behind, even from deep, just simply means that Fernandez is someone who can attack FPL points at all fronts and get those bonus points. And I think, you know, game week three slash four is an interesting time to kind of have Bruno as a captain. And, and I've gone a little bit safer in that sense to go and stick with Bruno. Uh, but you might want to go for Sun. You might want to go for, you know, a double up with the 7.5s. And that's up to you. But I just think it is a little bit safer to go with Bruno right now. And I think there's plenty of value in actually keeping Bruno in your team. Uh, just due to the fact that Man United also have nice fixtures. So when we actually move outside, I mean, obviously I have Brown Hill on my bench as well. But uh, if we move on to the forwards, uh, of course, you'll see that I have a triple up here. It's a very kind of template uh, triple up right now. I think the only kind of option that people would be would be looking for as alternatives to this would be Bamford uh, and probably Callum Wilson. And, and whilst I acknowledge that Callum Wilson is you know a fantastic fantasy performer, and, and that Newcastle seemed to be doing quite well in the preseason as well, uh, you know I, I I have a general kind of threat or kind of fear of Newcastle and their inability to maybe score goals over the course of the season and. You know, I, I feel like Callum Wilson is a player who finds form at specific points in the season. And uh, I'm not very confident that they necessarily will find fantastic opportunities with the kind of fixtures that they have. I think there are nicer fixtures for some of the other forwards. Uh, with Bamford, I think that's the, it's, it's almost the opposite, where I think he can score versus any opponent. But then I, I also look at Leeds and their performance uh, in the prior year. And I think that they definitely were, were a side that performed much better at home in their kind of own home ground. And... Um, I think you know starting the starting the season versus United uh, away. I think that's not exactly a great game, kind of um, potentially for Bamford to to find opportunities to score in. And I'm a little bit more tempted to go with Ings to start the season, given the fact that he was given the start uh, in, in a recent Aston Villa match, and that probably also means that he's ready to play the next game, especially since Watkins was kind of taken off with a knock. Uh, and for that reason, I think you know this is quite a template uh, forward line, right? With uh, getting Ings in my team now and and maybe taking a little bit of a gamble in that sense. The next player, of course, is going to be Tony, who is 100% a template player. And I think someone who's probably going to find his way increasingly in more and more teams due to the fact that there's so many injuries around the 6.5 to 7.5 price range. And, you know, simply put, I think I don't really want to kind of miss the boat in that sense. It's, it's a little bit of FOMO. Yes, I acknowledge that. But I think at the same time, whilst I don't think Brentford will do exceptionally well in the league this year, I think there's still potential where if you watch the way that Brentford play, it's it's very clear that they have a, a specific plan in action that very much involves Tony. It's not like there are some sort of free-flowing offense kind of like leads where anyone can score, but still Brentford becomes uh, a key target and key threat. It, it's, re it's really almost like a route one style of play where uh, I think Tony is part and parcel of the goal-scoring process. And I think it's interesting with somewhat nicer or more lenient fixtures for Brentford that you go for Tony just for that kind of punt. And then you can kind of side grade into players like Puki um, later on in the game weeks, or maybe you can move into Rodrigo if you think he's performing very well in that kind of 10 role for Leeds. The issue I have with Rodrigo, of course, is playing at that 10 spot. Yes, while he might have a little bit uh, more minutes in terms of game time, he's a little bit further away from goal. And I don't necessarily like that kind of uh, opposite effect of the out of position-ness of, of his play. Uh, but the last player I have is, you know, it's Antonio. And, you know, you, you, you could say that I have the Tony brothers. You could say I have um, a, a double up of the glass hamstrings. But uh, I've gone for Antonio because, simply put, I think he's had a fantastic preseason. He seems very fit to start the year. And I think, you know, at least for the first few weeks, I'm hoping I can actually get the most out of Antonio uh, before some fateful injury happens. And, I think he's had fine form in the preseason. His combination with Ben Rama has been fantastic. And for that reason, I think it makes a lot of sense to go for Antonio, especially especially as we mentioned, due to the kind of impacts on, on forwards recently. And um, West Ham has some ra rather nice fixtures. Leicester, as I mentioned, is a fixture that people are going to look down upon and say that's a tough one. But West Ham were very handily uh, scoring versus Leicester many times last year. And I think... Um, like structurally both of these teams play a very similar structure and both of them kind of uh, have an emphasis on kind of playing counter-attacking football while West Ham of course are a little bit more focused around the kind of double pivot and, and I would say Lex Leicester is a bit more tactically flexible uh, but the style of play is in, in my opinion rather similar uh, but 
with West Ham potentially being a little bit more attacking with the involvement of the fullbacks. And I mean, simply put, I think West Ham have so many avenues of actually finding goals. And Antonio is that kind of perfect talisman where he is both a very mobile and dynamic player in terms of how easily he finds it to kind of run off the shoulder defenders. But then he's also a huge, huge set piece threat. And, you know, his strength is really unmatched versus most centre backs. And I think I love Antonio and I want, and I want to start the season with him. Um, but yeah, that's it. That's going to be my game week one team so far. I do plan on actually making a kind of game week one team selection kind of guide where it's not going to be focused on a specific XI and me explaining that XI, but rather I'm going to be looking at the best picks that I have available, kind of like within the spreadsheet that I have in front of me, where we can actually look at the best options and other potential kind of variations. And I also do plan on doing a few live streams as we kind of get closer to the deadline maybe kind of looking at rating your teams and kind of doing a little bit more Q&A type uh, work as well. And obviously, if there's kind of impactful transfers coming in, um, I might do some content on planning ahead, such as, for example, if Lukaku is coming in um, for the future game weeks. But, you know, ultimately, this is going to be my kind of ga uh, game week one side. There's definitely, you know, a lot of differentials here, in my opinion, and, and a lot of it is kind of gambling on hoping that some of these players will have a very strong start to the season. And for me, I'm, I'm the type of player who thinks that if I watch all the kind of matches within the first three, four game weeks, I can get a lot of value in an early wild card. And that is my plan ultimately. So, you know, when we say set and forget, um, that's that's kind of why the reason I don't necessarily have someone who's set and forget, like, like Rafinha in my team and some other players that you guys might be looking to, even Sun, for example. And uh, But we can discuss more about that in the future. Uh, otherwise, ha have a wonderful week ahead and I'll see you guys in the next video.